When, when I graduated medical school in Austria, the first thought I had was to move to places like uh, PNG, or Papua New Guinea, and then also New Zealand. And I sent a letter to the government of New Zealand uh, to see if they needed young doctors. And they said, no way, we don't need it, we're fine. So finally I arrived here, a sandwich between these two New Zealanders. So my dream finally comes true. Um, can I see this any bigger here? Let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll manage. So, I want to talk from the experiences that we've had, and these experiences began in a place called the Bronx. And, and when we talk about India and when we talk about Africa, we forget that you know America is a country of diversity, and that a place like the Bronx is is known as a place of lots of struggles, lots of uh, difficulties, blight, but also lots of power, empowerment, political movement. So that's where we started. And, uh, and I was, at the time, a psychiatrist working in a state hospital, a large institution. And I had the uh, great fortune to work in the place where people got stuck, people who were, at the time, considered mental patients. And I saw myself as helping them get out of that situation, hopefully forever. Um, in that situation, obviously, I was in a position of power. I was the person that ran a unit as a psychiatrist. And I discovered that you can actually think about sharing power. And uh, when you do that, in a situation like that, which is a mental institution, people will rise to that opportunity. People who are kept there as inmates will rise to that opportunity. And this is something that's actually known of most institutions, wherever you look, even in the 19th century. People have been able to rise to the opportunity when they were given a chance. Uh, in our case, so what happened was uh, rather remarkable that uh, some of the patients there came up with ideas, and one of the ideas was to build an outreach program for homeless people. Most of the people on the unit were homeless. And so William Brown was one of the founders, and we had that. We got a federal grant for it. And it was a very successful program. Um, was for, and almost everyone in that program were members of a minority community, and really incredible. So from that program, we had a lesson, number two, which is that people, when people find out that they can actually give something to others, when they can be helpful, when they can be uh, looked at as a leader or looked at as someone who has experienced things that they haven't maybe experienced yet, they will rise also to this occasion and they will feel empowered and it will transform their own lives personally. William Brown, for example, told me, you know, he was in the street, I was in the street preaching in New York City as a homeless man and now I don't have to do that anymore because people respect me as the leader of Share Your Bounty. That was very powerful. But as we uh, discovered this idea, but we didn't discover many places, many people discovered this idea uh, already a long time ago, but formally it was pretty much in the 80s. Then we also so suddenly had the idea that maybe that could become formalized and meaning that people could become hired and work as what we then decided to call that position of a peer specialist. Celia Brown was the first leader of that and continues in, to this day in New York State to lead the peer specialist movement, uh, actually working for the government. And what happened with the peer specialists was that if peer specialists are engaged to work uh, side by side with their peers who are still in more difficult situation, they will have a specifically beneficial impact. And the word specific is important because a lot of times we say, oh, well, peer workers can do a lot of things, you know, we can do, they can do this, they can walk with people to the community, we can accompany them to appointments. That's not what we were looking for at that time. In fact, we found the specificity of the contribution was the most important thing and not some other tasks that maybe mental health providers would come up with. So the next level was there were suddenly a large number of brilliant people attracted 
to what we were doing. And so they flock, came flocking to the Bronx, and one of those people was Miriam Kravitz, who was a lawyer who had been institutionalized. And, and she, she had a brilliant thought, which was uh, that you can uh, help people by founding an organization that was peer-run that would actually support other peers and other peer-run uh, peer businesses. So that was rather uh, advanced as a notion in the, in the early 90s. And in fact, they did get into trouble which was that once the system realized how far they can go, how strong their minds and ideas are, um, they shut them down. You know, it became a really threatening enterprise. And to this day, I believe it has not been uh, replicated anywhere precisely for that reason, because it started to be, it was funded for with a million dollars per year. It started to be an, an eyesore for the system. And I, I thought that was actually a very good thing. Um, so now we run into some difficulties because we had shown that peers make a significant, substantial personal contribution. So everybody wanted to have peer specialists in all kinds of different places in the system that were actually places of harm. For example, an ACT team. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with ACT. ACT is a model that trans transports the institution into the community and spreads it into the homes of people, right? Are you familiar with ACT here, ACT teams, anybody? Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it, these are teams that are set up to monitor, also to support, but by and large, they're pretty coercive and everybody really understands it. So, but peers were wanted on those ACT teams and were in a position suddenly to become oppressors at the same time as they were peer workers. Um, so, may I already said this thing where people start to get employed, you know, and we were talking about people come out of poverty, we were people coming out of homelessness, and suddenly they had a job, which was not a, a very well paid job, but still it was a job that paid maybe $25,000, so people could live, it was a sub substantive wage, but, uh, those people were never able to become engaged in a movement that continued to be critical of what was happening in the mental health system. And to this day, in New York State has trained many hundreds of people. The Howie, Howie the Harp was a man some of you have met here. He was a man who was very missed still, beautiful organizer in California. He came to New York to start a training institute Sadly, he passed on uh, only one year after he came and started that, but still, this place is still in existence, the Hawina, and it has trained hundreds and hundreds of people, but almost all of them work in places where they're no longer accessible and no longer able to contribute to uh, a movement. Um, so, however, on the, on the positive side, if, a, if peer workers are actually invited to work in services that, that explicitly aim to reduce coercion and institutionalization, they will actually be able to make a contribution that averts harm and promotes recovery. Those are really rare examples, and we've only recently had an opportunity to do that in the uh, Parachute Project, which is a, a combination of uh, need-adapted open dialogue, a team that goes out into the community, and also peer uh, run or respites that primarily hire peer workers. Those settings, though, that team really has been able to, and I'm a, I, I, I believe peer run organizations should be autonomous and independent and do whatever they choose to do. But I also believe that collaboration with peer workers and peer specialists and peer experts is, is, a, is a really important thing that we should be looking at. Equal footing on collaboration. So in those teams, that kind of thing happens where the peer worker joins, and I'll talk a little bit about Open Dialogue later in the workshop, the peer worker joins the team and is an equal member and it becomes a real uh, cross-fertilization and collaboration. And I, I do believe in that and I think we've done too little of that. And the crisis respites are also quite successful as you all probably know, and peers have a huge role there in, uh, in, in averting uh, harm from the mental health system. So, um, I'm almost done here, the lesson number eight. So if peer workers 
are charged with, are charged with preventing coercion, minimizing or averting the use of medication and supporting individuals during crisis, they will make a significant difference and affect the practice of psychiatry. However, this is where the problem starts because psychiatry does not actually want that to happen. Psychiatry does not want to pay people salaries so they stop psychiatry from doing what psychiatry keeps doing, wants to keep doing. So this is a conundrum and I'm not quite sure how to address that because in fact there are almost no, unless somebody tells me, there are almost no examples where that is actually happening. Uh, it used to be the case um, that the mental health commissioner in New York State was a forward-looking man who said, you need to actually force us to do things. You need to sue us in court <laughs> in order to do the right thing. Now, uh, the next commissioner then said, Peter, if you do that one more time, if you go out and be an expert in a lawsuit against our organization, you're going to get fired. So uh, since then, it's been silence. You know, people have not been able to articulate oppositional views safely. You know, they are not safe and they are not being... Uh, allowed to do that, and in fact the opposite is the case. People are often bullied and harassed if they express attitudes that are too antagonistic towards the system. So what's the outlook for the future, from my perspective? I think we do need to lay down some rules and we should think about how to do that, because clearly people are free to work wherever they choose to work, whether they're peers or not. But I don't believe, you know, that people should work in places where coercion is the rule of the day. I think people, uh, if people want to help people in inpatient units, that's a legitimate thing to do. But then they should not be employed by that hospital for that role. That role should be supported from the outside by peer-run organizations, for example. Yeah. Um, I don't think peers should ever be uh, in a position where they actually monitor or check or go out in the community and see if people take their medications or see uh, if they brush their teeth that day. I think that's a humiliating situation, but it is done often and it is done frequently and I think it's horrible and I think it should be stopped. Um, I think people should actually receive training where they are able, and I think we'll hear more about that in a moment, to support people in serious crisis, not to say, okay, well, now this is enough, we can't do this anymore, you have to go to the hospital, which happens frequently to this day that peer workers are collaborating with hospitalizations, often involuntary hospitalizations, and I think that needs to be stopped. And, you know, I do believe that prevention is probably one of the things that's most important and that we do the least of, because we often deal with it, we often deal with harm retrospectively after it's happened many years if people have already been harmed both physically and emotionally and socially and for me it would be wonderful if peers could become involved very early in the lives of their peers uh, when people are young when people are just experiencing their first crisis so that that things could be averted and that would be one place where peer work could be an invaluable contribution and it is beginning to happen a little bit, very small, but I think we need to hopefully collaboratively figure out where peer workers could make the most difference and prevent the most harm and that's what I look forward to doing maybe in the future, although I'm sort of done working in the system. Thank you very much.